Hey guys, it's Daniel. Welcome back. When it comes to grunge and visual artwork, it's well documented that Kurt Cobain enjoyed creating art. But what's not as well known is that Lane Staley also enjoyed creating visual artwork. As a matter of fact, the cover art for Mad Season's album Above was made by Lane Staley. The artwork was created from a collage of printed material touched up and encompassed by a hand-drawn frame, which was pasted over the cover of another album cover. It's a bit confusing, but bottom line, Lane Staley was the chief creative architect for the visuals there. As a matter of fact, a handwritten letter from Lane Staley to his record label says, Here is the album cover. There are absolutely no touch-ups, flaws, or imperfections needed to be corrected or messed with. Please reproduce this for vinyl, compact disc, and tape cassette as is according to correct size. Thank you so much, Lane plus Mad Season. In a separate letter to the label, Lane said the following, Attention, art department. You may wish to try reversing the print from black to white and background, white to black. Try it and see, but the lettering itself is perfect to us. Don't change. Now, in this video, I'm going to be reading to you a quote from Nick Pollock, one of Lane Staley's ex-bandmates, where he touches on Lane Staley's artwork. Now, when I say Nick Pollock is one of Lane Staley's ex-bandmates, the band I'm referring to is Alice in Chains, spelt like this. This, of course, was the name of a glam metal band Lane Staley was part of before the grunge band Alice in Chains. This quote from Nick Pollock references an experience he had at an Alice in Chains show in the summer of 1993. This quote is from Alice in Chains' The Untold Story. Quote, we went on his bus and he showed a bunch of his artwork, which was very dark and introspective at that time. In some cases, kind of odd. I don't know how to really qualify that more than it was odd. I think he was in a really dark place. Here's Lane, who's kind of an alien in his own skin, showing, Here, I've been doing this artwork, and I did these photo things. I think they were with Demri and stuff like that. They were just like, wow, where the heck is her? But... It wasn't obvious by looking at them that he's got all the drug problems and that stuff. He had things where he actually had photographs of himself that were very gaunt. It was just strange. He was dealing with the weight of his musical career and everything that was going on with that. The weight of his drug situation. And I think that emotionally, in a lot of ways, just the weight of a lot of those things from his past that he could never deal with, that he was still dealing with, and trying to blot out with drugs, end quote. At another show that summer, Lane Staley's two other ex-bandmates from the glam metal band Alice in Chains attended another one of his shows. The ex-bandmates were Johnny Bacolis and James Bergstrom. James Bergstrom once recalled the following, Johnny Bacolis and I sat on the side of the stage by the manager watching them, and it was a fabulous show. We just hung out with Lane and had so much fun, you know. It was like we were kids again. I think he struggled being away. The grind of the road and the whole lifestyle. Obviously, with his addiction, it was just fostering sadness and unhappiness. End quote. I made a video previously about Johnny Bacolis and Lane Staley, how they were living together, and Johnny Bacolis was reflecting upon what it was like living with Lane Staley. At one point in the mid-90s, Lane Staley and Johnny Bacolis lived together. At the time, Lane Staley was really struggling with depression, and according to Johnny, his depression largely came as a result of his heroin use and the lifestyle it created for him. In an interview with journalist Greg Prado, Johnny Bacolis went into detail about what it was like living with Lane as he was struggling with heroin and depression. Johnny also at one point touches on Mad Season and how Mike McCready really tried to help Lane overcome his struggles. Quote, Right after they recorded Jar of Flies, Lane was really hitting a wall. We went camping one weekend in that period. He was trying to kick heroin. He asked me if I would move in with him and I guess help him out, which ultimately, I just ended up enabling him. Made it a lot easier for him to do what he did. So we lived together in the mid-90s. I was smoking weed. I wasn't doing anything like he was doing. That's why he trusted me, I think. There was such a cloud of depression over that house because of the heroin. If you were to live with any heroin addict, you're going to eventually reach an enough is enough type thing. What he would do is write me letters and put them on the base of my bed. I would wake up in the morning and I would have a four to six page letter handwritten and he would explain everything that we talked about the prior night regarding his life, how unhappy he was, and what was going on with him. He didn't really speak about Alice in Chains. 
As a matter of fact, I wasn't even really allowed to speak about Alice in Chains when I lived with him. There were two rules, no interventions and no listening to Alice in Chains music. Unfortunately, he wasn't getting any better. I felt like by me keeping the house clean, doing the laundry, and getting the groceries, I was making it real easy for him to be an addict. After talking to his mom and his stepfather, even his sisters at the time, I came to the realization that I was enabling him more than I was helping him. And now, it was taking a personal toll on me. Because coming home every night, it was not a happy household. He tried and he wanted it to be. He gave it his all. But with heroin in the calculus, it just wasn't going to be a happy household. I had to make a decision for myself and get out of that environment. The depression came from the cycle of heroin. The lifestyle you lead, the diet. All he really ate day and night was sugar. So I don't think he was getting a lot of nutrients. He wasn't exercising at all. What I've learned from my experience is that it's the lifestyle that kills you more than the heroin. The lifestyle is what causes the ultimate depression and being chained to this horrible drug. Eventually, they turn on you and now you're depressed and you may not know a way to get out of it. I had probably just two phone calls to Lane during the last couple of years of his life. They were pretty short. There's a time to talk to Lane and there's a time not to talk to Lane during that point. If someone's using... That's not the time to dive into stuff with them. You wanted to catch him at the perfect opportunity. Now, going back to when Lane and I were living together, the mad season thing came about when Mike McCready went to Hazelden Treatment Center to get clean and sober. His roommate was a guy named John Baker Saunders. He told Baker, come back to Seattle with me. I'll make sure you have a place to stay. We'll start this band, stay busy, and support each other. So they came back to Seattle, and McCready started calling our house. Lane didn't answer the phone very often or answer the door, so I would answer the phone and we would talk. I would then talk to Lane and say, hey man, McCready's calling. Mike's a good guy and he wants to talk to you. He's sober. Mike McCready is one guy that comes to mind that really tried to help Lane. There was this guy, for instance, named Lowell, who loved Lane. Lane himself really listened to and looked up to this guy. McCready would bring Lowell in and give Lane kind of the surprise attack. Personally, I would always tell Lane, Lane, why don't you take off? Go to some deserted island, hire the best counselors, and just kick this stuff. Go for six months if you have to. Lane's rebuttal would be, Johnny, I have celebrity status, and I have a lot of money. I could fly planes out to deliver me the dope if I wanted to, and that's what I would do. I can't escape. 